Greetings, good people of the universe. Welcome back to microbiology. Um, in this chapter, chapter four, we're going to discuss microscopy and staining. We'll have a little bit of a discussion in classification and identification. By this point in the semester, you've probably already talked about, or even if you've had an introductory biology class, you've talked about um, taxonomy and you've talked about the binomial nomenclature. So we'll just hit on it just a little taste, but a majority of this chapter is going to be focused on the main tool of microscopy. Of, my, of microbiology, which is the microscope and microscopy. So, and kind of getting you an understanding of exactly what it is we're working with, kind of like we did with the previous um, session in Chapter 3, where we looked at the chicken egg and compared, like, the pox virus, staphylococcus, um, and then also looking at, like, a parasite, like a protozoan, the giardia. So we're kind of kind of do the same thing, except that we won't use images of different organisms. We're going to talk about units of length. So I'm not going to give a full detailed lecture on the metric units of length, except to say that, as you know, in science and in biology, we primarily use the metric system. And the meter is the standard unit of length. The liter is the standard unit of uh, volume for liquid. So since we're talking about size here, then we're going to use the standard unit of length in the metric system, which is the meter. So one meter is about the length of a tapeworm. And if we go a little bit smaller and go to a tenth of a meter, so at a tenth of a meter, um, we don't really have anything that we look at the micro microbiological application of the unit on there. But a decimeter is about a tenth of that. A centimeter, each one of the hash marks that are in a meter stick, so envision a yardstick is what we would call it in the U.S., but envision a yardstick or a meter stick, and then look at the little tiny hash marks that we have in there. And if you count them, they go all the way to 100. So there are 100 centimeters in one meter. And um, so when we calculate look at that, um, the size of that would be like the diameter of a mushroom cap. So you're looking at about 12 centimeters for the diameter of a mushroom cap. Millimeters, if you go back to that yardstick, and that yardstick had the larger lines that were the centimeters, in between those centimeter lines are going to be millimeters. In fact, there are 10 millimeters in each centimeter. So if there are 100 centimeters and 10 millimeters within each one of those 100 centimeters, then that tells us that there are a thousand millimeters in one meter. So on that meter stick, there are a thousand of the really small hash marks. Now keep in mind that this level at the millimeter is the smallest that we'll be able to see with the naked eye. So examples of things that would be measured in millimeters would be the diameter of a bacterial colony. So on our auger plates, our nutrient auger plates, and we saw those different colonies from um, our uh, testing of different places where we did our shoe and we did our um, our cell phones and we did the toilet seat or the inside of the toilet seat or the door handle and we looked at our place and we saw all those different colonies. The average diameter of a colony is about two to three millimeters. Um, how thick a tick would be would be about 5.7 millimeters. So as you see, we're getting very, very small. Now, once we get to the point of a micrometer, a micrometer has one million, it's one one millionth of a meter. So um, if we were to look at that on a yardstick, there'd be a million of those little tick marks on a, micro, on a yardstick of micrometers. But remember, we can't see that with our naked eye. So for micrometers, things that we would um, measure would definitely be that of cells bacteria included, and also white blood cells. And down at a nanometer, nanometers are very, very, very small. So a nanometer is going to be about the diameter of a pol the polio virus. So here's just another picture that's kind of showing the same thing, but it's showing you different organisms that represent those sides. So what I'm asking of you now is to kind of refresh for our exam, refresh your understanding of the metric system, um, because we will be discussing that on your exam. And then I also want you to just kind of explore and just look at some of these organisms so that you can have a frame of reference when we begin to talk about um, why the microscope is important and um, the relative size in comparison. So I'll just give you a second to kind of go over this. Notice that for the compound microscope, 
the one that we use in lab primarily, the compound microscope only has a certain range that it's able to see things. Things are as large as a flea at 10 micrometers, and things that are as small as um, typical bacteria, which is right about here at about half a micrometer. So right at this point here is where we can see it. To see anything smaller than that, you're going to have to use a scanning electron microscope, a transmission electron microscope, or a scanning tunneling microscope for anything smaller than that. Um, electron microscopes, the two primary electron microscopes that are used in microbiology are transmission and scanning. Because we're really not concerned with seeing molecules of water or amino acids or um, any of those other atoms or things like that. So that everything that we need to see we can use with a transmission or a scanning electron microscope. Notice how limited the human eye is as to what we can see. So the general principles of microscopy is that we're looking at wavelengths of radiation, specifically if we're talking about electron microscopy. Um, also, even if we're talking about light microscopy, we're still talking about wavelength. A good rule of thumb is, is that the shorter the wavelength, the higher the resolution. What resolution means is that it's the ability to distinguish two objects as separate entities from one another so that you can see that even though they're really, really close together and they're really, really small, you can tell that they're two different objects. That's a little bit different than magnification, which is another principle of microscopy. Magnification is basically saying how big can we blow this image up, how big can we make this image for us to see it, whereas resolution is looking for more defineness to clear up those edges. And that is the job of the oil immersion objective on your microscope. And then contrast, contrast helps us to be able to see the specimen against different backgrounds. And so in order to do that with our light microscopes and even with electron microscopes, it's going to require some staining to take place. You'll notice when we look at the yeast cells, or if you looked at yeast cells in other classes under the microscope, we didn't stain them. So when we didn't stain them, we couldn't see them very, very clearly. Uh, we had to actually turn the di iris diaphragm down so that we could get some contrast. So as I said before, the shorter the wavelength, the higher the resolution that we would have. Light, visible light is in a certain spectrum. So right here is that visible light spectrum. So this is just the, rev, um, the representative wavelength for that. As we start to get down into electron microscopes, notice how the wavelengths get smaller. So from crest to crest is a wavelength. And the shorter those crest to crest units are, the higher the resolution. So contrast is the difference between the intensity between two objects or an object in its background. Um, staining helps to increase that contrast, and the use of light in its phase increases contrast as well. So the contrast is really just the ability to have an object, your specimen, specifically stick out for you. Now, our primary tool in an introductory microbiology class is the light microscope, specifically the bright field microscopes. Um, we can use dark field microscopes, but we just don't use any in our class. Um, and dark field microscopes are really useful for, for viewing things that you don't want to stain or you can't stain um, in order to get that contrast because they'll stand out against that dark background. Bright field microscopes um, are, can be simple. And a simple microscope means that it contains only one lens. So instead of having the objective piece and the eye pieces that we have in our microscopes, which are considered compound microscopes, they just have one lens. And it's very similar to a magnifying glass. In fact, Leuvenhoek used a simple microscope to observe many different microorganisms, so they're quite effective. And his microscope would be considered a simple bright field microscope. Now, the more advanced version of that simple microscope is a compound microscope. So that means that there are more, there's more than one set of lenses there. So we know we have our ocular lenses, which are our microscopes, and most microscopes are 10 times magnification. And then there's those various different objectives on the nose or the end of the microscope that get closest to the slide. And they range from four times magnification up to 100 times magnification if we're using an oil immersion objective. In order to get the total magnification, we have to multiply the magnification of the objective lens but however one you're using, whether it's 4, 10, 40, or 100, and also that of the ocular lenses. 
Um, using of the oil immersion objective is what helps to increase that resolution. So remember, when we talk about resolution, we're talking about wavelength. So it helps to make sure that the wavelength is a little bit tighter and that the light goes through the objective and isn't scattered or refracted off into the environment, that it goes straight through the objective and it gives a nice clear picture. And you've probably observed that. When you put your oil emergent objective down, what was once diffused and kind of grainy, you can kind of see uh, a lot clearer now as a result of the oil and the, the increase in resolution because of the oil emergent objective. So here's a beautiful picture that is illustrating everything that I have just said. So when we don't have the oil that's in use, we're still working in an air environment, and light is one of those things that can scatter out. The light source, some of it's going to be refracted and lost. So not all of those light rays are going through the objective to, for you to view the image that's on your slide. So some of it's going to be lost and, it lost, and it's going to reduce the quality of the resolution for the image that you see back in the eye key. When we have a um, the oil immersion on there, so notice how the oil is on there, that nice thick oil, and this is one of the reasons why oil is one of those things in microbiology that too much of it is not usually a problem, is that we don't have all of those light rays that are refracted and lost off to the environment. In fact, there are more light rays, so there's more of a concentrated use of that wavelength that go into the objective lens so that you can make the picture a lot clearer and easier for you to see when you're viewing it under the microscope with your oil immersion objective. So other types of light microscopes that we're going to be interested in are fluorescent microscopes. Now, we won't use them in our class in introductory biology, microbiology, but I think they're important to discuss because they are of clinical significance. Instead of using just regular visible white light as we use for our, our bright field compound microscopes, it's going to use ultraviolet light um, to source at the specimen. The specimen radiates energy back at a longer, more visible wavelength, and that UV light is going to increase the resolution and increase the contrast. Why I feel that micro, uh, fluorescent microscopy is important is because it has clinical significance. We can use it for immunofluorescence to identify various different pathogens and also to make visible a variety of different proteins. So in order to see things like syphilis, and maybe even other spirochetes, we can use fluorescent microscopy. And here we have a picture of that happening. Um, so I'm going to let you guys kind of look at this and see if you can kind of determine what's going on, and then we'll discuss it in just a second. So with this immunofluorescence, what we're doing is that we have these fluorescent dyes, and then those fluorescent dyes are um, going to be attached to these antibodies. And in order to determine whether or not the individuals whose specimen that we have taken as a sample, to see whether or not they actually have um, this particular um, bacterial infection, what we can do is we can take the antibodies that we know would be attracted to the antigens on the surface of the bacterium, and we can dye them. So that those dyed antigens, if that the bacteria is there, is present, then our antibodies will be attracted to them, and it will spread the bacterial cells to these antibodies carrying the dye so that we can look at it underneath the microscope and we will see it for us as we have in this image over here. Now, this isn't an, an electron microscope. It's just a regular old light microscope. That's what LM stands for. So by using a regular old light microscope and this fluorescent dye, and um, this uh, fluorescent microscopy, we're able to give a diagnosis at a much faster rate without having to run a lot of biochemical tests. We'll still run biochemical tests just to be sure, but this is a great way to get a clinical diagnosis of various different um, bacterial infections. So on to the electron microscopes. Electron microscopes are going to give you the greatest resolution. Why do they give you the greatest resolution? Well, what did we discuss earlier? Shorter wavelength, greater resolution. So electron microscopes have a shorter wavelength, so they have a greater resolving power. They also happen to have a greater magnification. They're able to magnify objects between 10,000 and 100,000 times their actual size. So we can get a very detailed view of things like bacteria, viruses, the intracellular structures of bacteria or any other type of cell, molecules, and even some really large atoms we can see with an electron microscope. There are two different types of electron microscopes, transmission and scanning. 
Transmission electron microscopes are going to allow you to see those internal cellular structures and even on the inside of the inside of those structures. So we could, we're talking eukaryotic cells, we could see the inside of a nucleus or the inside of a Golgi apparatus. Um, if we're talking about prokaryotic cells, we could see the inside of a ribosome and the inside of that bacterial cell. Scanning electron microscopes give you a nice three-dimensional picture of the outside of the cell. So here is a transmission electron microscope. Um, in order to use an electron microscope, typically the specimen has to be killed. And that's different from the light microscope, where we can look at living objects underneath a light microscope, which we do in lab all the time. Um, but with an electron microscope, in order to view those specimens and to get that short wavelength to bounce off of the um, specimen that you're viewing and give you a picture back to um, the, the person that's viewing it, we have to stain them with heavy metals. So we have to stain them with things like silver and mercury, um, those really heavy metals. And that typically is going to kill our specimen. In addition, for transmission electron microscopes, many of the preparations may require that we slice the specimen into very, very thin layers in order to view the internal structures. So one of the drawbacks of an electron microscope is that we have to kill our specimen. And the other drawback is that they're kind of expensive. So on the B, the bargain basement version of an electron microscope, you know, the one that's on super clearance and not the name brand type, is going to probably run you about 10 grand. So it's about $10,000 for the least expensive electron microscope. And then the price is just going to skyrocket from there. So here are some pictures of a scanning electron microscope. So notice that the pictures of the scanning electron microscope, unlike what we saw on the previous slide, we're looking at internal structures. With the scanning electron microscope, same principles apply. We're using shorter wavelengths. They're expensive machines, and you have to stain your specimen with heavy metals. Um, we can see a lot greater definition. And in my opinion, they're always just prettier pictures, the things that we look at with the scanning electron microscope. Um, Aspergillus, which we've looked at in lab class, it looked a lot nicer. You can actually see the three-dimensional quality of the aspergillus and the spores here um, than what we noticed in class. Um, the same thing with the paramecium. You can actually see all of the cilia. That's as a result of the increased magnification and the increased resolution. And then we can see our individual balls of streptococcus. Typically, when we see the term strep, that means that these balls are going to be, um, these cocci are going to be in chains. And staph means they're going to be in clusters. And we'll talk more about that as we go throughout the semester. Probe microscopy on here, um, we won't be using probe microscopy on here, but it's, we use it typically to look at things that are very small, specifically um, molecules, so DNA and enzymes or those proteins, we can use probe microscopy for that. And that's also a form of an electron micro microscope. So in order to see these different images, staining is required. And we talked about the limitations of staining with electron microscopes and that we have to use these really heavy stains and that usually kills our specimen. But we also use staining with our light, bright field microscopes that we have in lab. So in order to provide that contrast, this is why we're going to be using that staining. And there are various different staining mechanisms that are just kind of a hallmark of microbiology. One of which we've already talked about very briefly in Chapter 3 is gram staining. But we also have acid fast staining that takes place as well, that we do fairly regularly. But then there's also staining of endospores and staining of flagella. So there are other mechanisms and, and ways that we can stain objects um, in microbiology and even in just an introductory microbiology course. So when we prepare a specimen for staining, and a lot of this is probably um, very intuitive to you or something that you've seen before, we're first going to want to put our culture on a thin film on our slide, and then we let it air dry a little. Now, granted, it's probably not going to air dry completely. You may have some areas where it's still a little bit wet, but we then want to place it um, through a flame to fix it. So by heat fixing, and this is what this process is called, by heat fixing, our specimen, we're doing two things. We're allowing the specimen to stay stuck to the slide, thing one, and thing two, since we're working with bacteria, we're also killing the specimen so we don't run the risk of contamination or of, of our microscopes or of anything else that we're using. So we kill it, and then we make sure that it's attached firmly to the slide. 
the basic principles of staining is that we use some sort of dyes, and these dyes are typically salts, and salts can carry a charge to them, whether it's a positive or a negative char charge. What we call a chromophore is the actual colored portion of the dye. Anytime we use acidic, and let's go ahead and bring out the old highlighter. Anytime we use acidic dyes, acidic dyes will stain alkaline structures. So the charge of these acidic dyes is probably um, a, a positive charge. Alkaline structures are things that are like hydroxy ions and they're negatively charged. Basic dyes, on the other hand, are going to stain acidic structures. So the basic dyes can, and remember the, the, the old law that you guys learn, opposites attract. When you have a north end of a magnet and a south end of a magnet, they will come to each other. If you have a north end and a north end, they repel one another. So the same principles apply here. These acidic dyes can stain alkaline structures. Alkalines are bases. Bases are negatively charged. And this is just something from like a chemistry or from an introductory biology course. So these acidic dyes are going to be attracted to a negative structure. Basic dyes are negatively charged. They're attracted to acidic structures. Acids are things like hydrogen ions, and they carry a positive charge to them. Basic dyes are more common because the cell surface of a cell is more negatively charged. If we go back to what we talked about in Chapter 3, when we looked at the um, membrane potential, the cellular membrane potential of a bacterial cell, the eukaryotic cell, and we said that their resting potential is at negative 70 millivolts. Well, there's that negative number that we talked about. So the outside of the cell is negatively charged. So we want to have a dye that's positively charged that will be attracted to that negative charge of the cell so it can coat it. So that's why basic dyes are much more common. Simple stains mean that we just use one stain. So we're not using, you know, a series of stains. An example of simple stains, um, and it's usually a basic dye, crystal violet, which we've used, saffron, which we're going to use in our gram staining, and methylene blue, we use that to stain our cheek cells. So we just use one stain to stain our cheek cells. They're very useful in determining relative size, shape, and arrangement of the cells themselves. In order to differentiate between different classes of bacteria, we'll want to do what's called differential staining. So here's just a picture of some simple staining on here. So this is um, looks like malachite green for endospore staining. And then it looks like we have crystal violet that we have to stain these bacteria. Notice that we're just able to visualize them. We can see that we have some bacillus there. We have some cocci there. But we're not really able to tell who's gram negative, who's gram positive. Um, we're just looking at the, um, just looking at the relative size and shape of these different cells that we stain with the crystal violet. Now, differential staining is where we're going to use more than one dye. So in simple staining, we just use one dye, just like a simple microscope is just one lens. With differential staining, we're going to use more than one dye. And in the word differential, what word do you see? Different, right? So you want to be able to detect differences between the cells that you've stained on your slide. So you're going to be able to distinguish between different cells or chemicals or structures. We're more interested in staining between different, distinguishing between different cells. Common types of differential staining are gram staining, which we will do in class, endospore staining, and acid baths and histological stains. Um, we won't do either one of those in class, but those are just examples of it. Histological stains are where you're staining with various different um, stains to enhance different structures. So we use that more in, um, at our level in, a in um, anatomy and physiology. So here is the first thing that we're going to talk about, which for us is the most important staining procedure in an introductory microbiology class, and that is gram staining. So gram staining generally takes place in four steps. Now, there are some other steps that you'll have to, to do with rinsing the slide, letting the slide air dry, and that sort of stuff, um, and that's all outlined in your, your lab book. But the four basic parts of gram staining are right here in front of you. And what gram staining allows us to do is it allows us to differentiate between 
and gram positives and gram negatives. If you remember from chapter three, gram positives are more susceptible or they're more likely to be killed by antibiotics, whereas gram negatives are less susceptible to be killed by antibiotics. They're more resistant to them. They have this outer layer that kind of protects them from antibiotics and detergents. So gram negatives are generally more difficult to kill. And this is the very first process of our identification um, thing. So when we're trying to identify bacteria, this is the first thing, one of the first things that we'll do is that we'll gram stain it. So first things first, we want to flood our entire slide. So you're going to make a, a smear. You're going to make a fixed, um, a fixed slide. So that means that you put your specimen on there, you smear it, you stick it through the, let it air dry, stick it through the Bunsen burner to um, fix it on there. And then the next thing that we'll do is that we'll flood it with crystal violet. So we put all that crystal violet on there, we rinse it off with water, and then what we notice, if we were to stop at this point, we would see that that would just be simple staining, that everything on this slide is all purple. Okay, that's kind of like, duh, because we just used crystal violet. The next thing that we want to do is we want to use iodine. And by using that iodine, flooding that slide with iodine, is that we're now going to make sure that that purple stays fixed onto those cells that it can stay fixed onto. So for gram positives, remember, they only have that cell wall, that very thick cell wall. Gram negatives, they have that extra LPS layer that's surrounding them. So because they have that extra LPS layer, that means that crystal violet and that iodine is going to be attached to that LPS layer. So what iodine does is it acts as what we call a mordant. It helps to make sure that all of those cells on that outer surface remain purple. So after this point, if we were to stop our gram standing procedure at this point, everything is still going to be purple. Now we're going to start to get some differences here. So the third step that we have is that we're going to use ethanol and acetone, or we just call it an alcohol wash. We're going to rinse the solution with an alcohol wash. What that alcohol wash will do, alcohols are notorious for um, dissolving lipids. So just as something that you might be uh, familiar with, when you go on a night of binge drinking with your friends, not that any of you guys do this, but you've probably heard of people that do this, that they typically tell you that you should eat some greasy foods. Have something greasy in your stomach that's going to make sure that your hangover is not so horrible, and it's also going to slow down the process of your body of absorbing that alcohol through your stomach so you can drink more and have a merrier time. Once again, not that you do that but other people that may do it. So having those greasy foods in there, the alcohol actually breaks apart those greasy foods and it has something to work on before it actually crosses um, into your bloodstream. So alcohol is actually going to remove anything that has a phospholipid or lipid layer to it. And we know that gram-negatives have that LPS or lipopolysaccharide poly phospholipid layer associated with them. So those phospholipids are going to be disintegrated and washed away by the alcohol. So as a result, what happens is that if you are gram-negative, we're going to look at your slide after you rinse it with alcohol. If you were gram-negative, then notice that it seems like you disappeared. Those are there, like all these slides, all these cells here, and it's like, whoa, what the heck happened? Looks like they disappeared. They didn't disappear, just their LPS, that outer layer of those gram negatives, have disappeared. So the gram positives are still there and they're still purple, but the gram negative cells are now colorless. So in order for us to see those colorless cells, we have to now stain it with saffron. So the final step is to stain the slide with saffron and then rinse it with water and allow it to dry. And notice what we have now. We have these pink cells or these red cells. These are our gram negatives, these red cells. So these gram negative cells are pink or sort of reddish. And we will be gram staining a lot in lab. And as I said before, it is, this is a very, very important process in identifying bacteria. And especially for the students in my class where we'll have two unknowns which means I'm going to give you a test tube with some bacteria in it, and you're going to tell me what that bacteria is using this staining procedure and other biochemical tests. We'll talk a lot more about it as we get closer in the semester, but just to kind of start to plant those seeds in your head, that probably the most fun and interesting part of microbiology 
is the identification process, and it requires that we have a very intimate understanding of gram staining. So um, another type of differential stain is the acid fast stain, and we primarily use acid fast stains to stain things like um, mycobacterium, uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis is a great example of that. So in gram staining, our colors were purple and our colors were um, pink. And in acid fast staining, we have red and blue as our colors. So those would be blue and those would be red. Endospore staining is another staining mechanism. Um, we will actually use this in class. It helps to stain the endospore um, with malachite green. We use steam to drive that malachite green stain into the inside of the cell. And we can actually see whether or not these bacillus, which many species of bacillus um, form endospores. And what we're particularly looking at right now is bacillus anthracis, which is the, disease, the bacteria that causes the disease anthrax. But these green jobbies in here, these are those endospores that we talked about in Chapter 3. So the histological stains, the two common stains for that are the GMS stain and the HE stain. Um, and those are just for histological specimens like tissues, red blood cells, um, not the red blood cells, but white blood cells. You don't stain red blood cells. You can see them without, they have already have that color for contrast. Um, but for white blood cells, and you can stain um, the granules in them. So that's why when you look at the slides in AMP, sometimes the um, red, the neutrophils for white blood cells look different from one slide to the next as far as color is concerned. That's why we never, ever, ever in AMP just use color as a mechanism or a, a rule by which we're able to determine one tissue type from another, because it just depends on what type of staining mechanism that they use. So some special stains, um, negative stains will highlight capsules, and flagellar stains are going to highlight flagellas, and then fluorescent stains, we already talked about those with fluorescent microscopy, um, are to get things to glow for us so that we can get a positive or a negative diagnosis or confirmation for the presence or absence of various different types of bacterial infections. We will do a capsule stain, and we will actually use that capsule stain with Clebsiella pneumoniae. Um, what we're doing with this negative stain or capsule stain is that we can take India ink and actually stain the background. So we stain the background so that the capsule surrounding the bacteria, and this is pretty much exactly what it looks like, except ours is black. We use India ink. Um, um, we stain the background so that we can have the bacterium and its capsule be shown for us. So we can see the capsule that's surrounding it. And remember, the capsule falls into the category of a glycocalyx, and it's nice and tightly organized, helps to protect the bacteria. Um, we believe, and it also helps the bacteria to adhere to different surfaces. And we're just highlighting that capsule. And then for flagellar stain, we won't be doing a flagella stain, um, but this is a picture of Proteus vulgaris, which is an organism that we will work with in lab quite frequently. And we can see that it has flagella that are all around it. So we would consider Proteus vulgaris. Um, to be motile, which means it can move, does, got flagella. And we would also consider Proteus flagella as a raising of flagella to be peritrixis because they're all around. So um, we can use iodine or other um, mordant stains to help stain those flagella so that they show more contrast and you're able to see them. So here are those different stains that we um, looked at and we talked about with simple stains, differential stains, and those three different types of them, um, endospore staining, acid fast staining. So um, acid fast cells are red and non-acid fast staining cells are, are blue. And we use that for mycobacterium and nocardia and some other types of bacteria. And then we had our special stains here. As we have with every other time, I put a table in your notes. This is good to make a note card off of, or it's good to have memorized, because it gives you an at a glance of a comparison um, and a contrast of these different types of stains, and also what they're used for and what their results would look like. Now, staining for an electron microscope, very important, as I said before, we have to stain with heavy metals. 
The stains bind to the molecules in the specimen or to the background in order to give um, something for the electron to bounce that wavelength off of in order to give us an image. So we have to stain these heavy metals, so typically our specimen is going to die as a result of electron microscopy. All right, so the last little portion of this chapter is going to talk about classification and identification of microorganisms. We understand that taxonomy consists of classification, nomenclature, which is naming, and identification. That's important for us in microbiology because we want to be able to classify, organize, and name these various different microbiological specimens, even if we're just talking about bacteria. So we want to organize this large amount of information, and we also want to be able to make predictions about what, how these organisms or how an organism in one class is going to behave. Most likely, if we do our nomenclature correctly and our, our taxonomy correctly, actually, we'll find that many of these um, bacteria that are in the same class will behave in many of the same ways. Another reason that we have taxonomy, and there's an entire discipline that's devoted to this, is to understand evolutionary connections. So we have evolutionary phylogenetic trees and evolutionary phylogeneticists that are always looking at the relationship um, between different organisms and trying to understand those connections and how organisms are related to one another. So Carlos Linnaeus, you're very familiar with, he's kind of the father or the grandfather, if you will, of taxon taxonomy. His classification system was based on very common characteristics that he could actually see. So it was more morphologically based. So if you had fur, you went into mammals. If you laid eggs, you went into, you know, a different classification on there. So his classification scheme, although it's very archaic and sort of rudimentary, um, he was able to group organisms successfully. And he also was able to develop this idea of binomial nomenclature. Binomial means two, nomenclature means naming, so it just means two-part naming system. So your specific scientific name as a human would be a homo sapien. You have the genus of homo, and then you have sapien as your specific epitaph on there. Um, same process can also work for bacteria. So we have Staphylococcus aureus. Staphylococcus is going to be the genus, and then aureus is a specific epitaph. So although Carlos Linnaeus, his, his taxonomic um, categories were very broad, they still have a really good solid foundation in what we're able to do and been able to um, enhance on his work. So for Carlos Linnaeus, he really only follows two different kingdoms. So he said you're either plant or you're animal. Keep in mind that at this time we consider bacteria to be plants, so we put it in, you know, flora. So you've probably heard those terms before, flora and fauna. Fauna were animals, flora were, were plants and everything else. Later on, we decided to expand that into five different kingdoms. And those five different kingdoms that we had were animals, plants, fungi, protists, and prokaryotes on there. At this point in time, and actually this is how I learned it in high school and in college, at that point in time, we hadn't really teased out Arcadia from bacteria. So we just kind of grouped them all together as prokaryotes. Um, later on, we decided to take animals, plants, fungi, and protists, put them in eukarya domain, and then the prokaryotes were broken down into the archaea and in the bacteria domain. So what Linnaeus' goal was was just to categorize these um, animals um, and these plants in order to um, categorize them, to classify them, and to catalog them. Now, our modern goal is that we want to understand the relationships among these organisms. We want to see how this phylogenetic hierarchy is established. So what cells came first and how did some of their structures go off into the next generation to really show on a molecular level the evolutionary or a DNA or RNA level, the relationship between these vast, very vast different types of organisms and how they all fit with one another. So at this point, we have a much greater emphasis on the genetic material, and that's what has led us to this domain system of Arcadia, Bacteria, and Eukarya. So Carl Losey was the one, um, one of the people that helped to determine these um, uh, domains. 
and he was looking at nucleotide sequences of ribosomal RNA, and as a result of his research, we have those three domains there. And the cells in these three domains also differ from respect to one another in many other characteristics, not just by looking at the RNA sequences. So when we're ready to classify microorganisms, so so far those first two slides are kind of like a history of where we've gone and what we've talked about and how we've gotten to where we currently are now. So as this taxonomy and this identification and classification that we just talked about, how it relates to microbiology is that you have all of these classes of bacteria and they all kind of molecular, or I'm sorry, uh, morphology, morphologically look the same. So the shape and the size and some of those very basic characteristics are pretty much the same. It's not like with animals or plants where we can say, ah, this plant has three broad leaves and this plant has two broad leaves. No, there's a lot more similarities with bacteria. So we can't just rely on physical characteristics, although physical characteristics are a big part of our identifying different types of bacteria. Um, and we use those, those physical characteristics we just talked about in staining, whether it's gram staining or acid fast staining or endospore staining. We can also run biochemical tests. So we can see what types of chemicals can these bacteria or these cells use for energy or use for various different purposes. What kind of byproducts do they have? This is also an important feature of your unknown. In fact, Gram staining and running biochemical tests are the only two things that we're going to use to figure out how to identify this bacteria. More sophisticated and advanced ways of identifying and classifying bacteria and microorganisms are to run serological tests to see what antibodies they make and what type of antigens there are studied on top of them. So we're looking at protein sequences. We can use phage typing on there, what types of um, bacterial phages can affect this bacteria cell, there are certain phages that certain, um, and a phage is just a virus, a bacterial virus, um, certain viruses that can affect only certain types of cells. So we can use that as a way of identifying. And then also as an advanced method of identification and classification is analysis of nucleic acid. None of these things at the bottom are we going to be doing in an infectious microbiology class, but I think it's important that you are aware that these are more advanced ways to identify and classify microorganisms. We're going to stick right here between physical characteristics and biochemical tests. So physical characteristics are oftentimes used, and we talked about how we can use gram staining as a physical characteristic, endospore or acid fast staining. We can also just physically look at under a microscope what protozoan, fungi, algae, and parasitic worms look like, and we can do a lot of really good classification for these cells um, based along on their morphology or what their shape is or um, whether or not they have cilia, whether or not they have a flagella, what type of vacuoles do they have. So um, what we're going to do in lab class is that you're going to actually look at things like a paramecium and a euglena, which are both considered protozoan, and see how they're different from one another and how they would fit in different classifications. We can also do the same thing with bacterial colonies. Bacterial colonies, like those that were studied on your auger plates when you did your different samples from the environment, um, they also have distinct appearances. And you'll remember some colonies were glossy and white, some were kind of ashen and yellow, others had nice round edges, some others had, you know, irregular edges. The next step that we use is biochemical testing. So with biochemical testing, we're able to distinguish prokaryotes by their ability to use or produce certain chemicals. So what kind of byproducts do they have? What kinds of chemicals can they or can they not use in order to get energy? Um, we use biochemical tests um, to identify pathogens, and we're going to use biochemical tests in our class just to identify that unknown microscope that I'm, or unknown microbe that I'm going to give you throughout the semester. So here is an example of two different biochemical tests that we're going to use. Um, we have hydrogen sulfide tests. And we also have um, fermentation tests. Not all organisms can ferment sugars. So if they can ferment sugars, not only do we have sugar in these test tubes that start off red, we have sugar in the test tubes, but we also have a pH indicator. That pH indicator is usually seen all red, hence the red color. So if the bacteria can use those sugars 
and get energy out of it, they're going to produce a byproduct that is an acid. That acid is going to turn this red test tube into this yellow color if they can break down or ferment that sugar. They also may be able to produce a gas. So they might have a carbon dioxide gas come as a result of this fermentation process. So this will be considered a positive test for fermentation if we have a yellow color. And we would say not only is this tube positive for fermentation, but it's also positive for gas production. This tube, on the other hand, is positive for fermentation, but we do have acids that were made. So these bacteria that we placed into this test tube, they were able to use the sugars that we put in there, um, but it didn't make any gas. This test tube is inert. So if we put bacteria in there, then it couldn't use the sugar, um, so it didn't give you a gas byproduct. For hydrogen sulfide, we're looking to see um, if hydrogen sulfide is produced. And if hydrogen sulfide is produced, it gives you this nice black color. If not, it gives you this color over here. Hydrogen sulfide tests, we don't just use them by themselves. We actually use them with, um, we call them sulfur, um, and we use indole, um, which is the test the presence of a protein that was made, and also whether or not the microorganism could move for motility. So this will be considered a stem tube. We're only looking at one aspect of that stem tube, and that's the ability to produce hydrogen sulfide. Um, the other two things we just aren't looking at here, but there are three different tests that can be run in this one tube. So as I said before, we can use serological tests to identify bacteria. Um, many microorganisms can trigger an immune response that results in antibody production. Um, and the antibodies can be used to identify an organism. And here's a good picture of that um, using the agglutination test. It's one type of serological test. So we use this for blood typing so that if you have type A blood and want to know if your type, um, whether it is type A blood, we can put um, A antibodies into the serum of your blood and look for agglutination. And if that agglutination takes place, then we say, yay, you have type A blood because we put anti-A antibodies in there. If you have type B blood, we put the anti-A antibodies on there, those antibodies aren't going to attach to your red blood cells, so they won't be agglutination. So that's a good example of how we could use it. Um, we use it for blood typing, but we can do the same procedure with bacteria. Dichotomous keys, so once we've done our biochemical testing, um, we can use a dichotomous cue, which is basically a series of statements where only one of the two choices is correct. So it's an either or, as it applies to a particular organism. What a dichotomous cue will do, and we're going to build some dichotomous cues here in microbiology, as it helps direct us to a um, to name an organism. So it helps us to kind of window down and get to what this organism is based on the information that we know, whether it's physical, how it gram stains or, or acid fast stains, and also the results of those biochemical tests. Can it ferment sugar? Does it produce hydrogen sulfide? And so forth. So here's a beautiful picture of an example of a dichotomous key. So first things first, we gram stain, and then we ask the question, are the cells gram positive? Yes or no? If the answer is yes, then we know we're working with gram-positive bacteria. So if you look over here on this side, gram-positive cells, gram-positive bacteria. So if we go to 1B, gram-negative cells, then we have to go down to another question. So if they're gram-negative cells, we have to ask a few more questions to figure out what we're working with. So if we said there, no, they're not gram-positive, they're not purple, then we ask, are they rod-shaped? Yes or no. So if they are rod-shaped, yes, then we have to ask another series of questions. If the answer is no, they're not rod shaped, then we say that they're cocci shaped, they're, so if they're not rod, then they can be circular, or they're pleomorphic bacteria. So if it's no, then we just stop here. Same thing here, non rod shaped, we just stop there. If it is rod shaped, we have to go down to the series of questions for three. So at this area, can it tolerate oxygen? Yes or no? If it can tolerate oxygen, we have to ask another series of questions. Does it ferment lactose? If it doesn't tolerate oxygen, then we say oh, they're obligate anaerobes. But if we have to keep going further, does it ferment 
lactose or will it give you an acid if you put it into a test tube with um, that lactose sugar in there? Will it give you a yellow color to it? If no, then they're considered non-lactose fermenters. Or if we put them in a, a mannitol salt auger plate, do we get a yellow color change to it? All of these things we will talk about in lab class in further detail. Um, but um, if it does let ferment lactose, then we go do another biochemical test. And we say, can we use citric acid as its sole source of carbon? If no, then we have to ask, can it produce gas from, from glucose? If it can produce gas from glucose, then it's um, E. coli, Escheria. If not, then it's Shigella. If it can use, if it can use uh, citrate and gives us a, a nice color change in that citrate too, then we have to do a hydrogen sulfide test. When we do that hydrogen sulfide test, we want to see does it produce um, acetonin or does it give us that black color? If yes, then it's salmonella. If no, then we have to um, give us do another test too. We have to do an endo test. And so for that endo test, we say, does it produce acetonin? If yes, then it's enterobacter. If, um, if yes, it's enterobacter. And if not, then it's enterobacter. So this is just a very simple example of a dichotomous key. We will work with dichotomous keys in our class. In any microbiology class, usually it's going to have a discussion on working with dichotomous keys, especially as you're trying to identify your unknown. So there'll be more discussions and sessions on how to properly construct and to um, go over um, the use of your dichotomous key and how to properly um, lay it out. All right, so that is the end of this session. I hope you all are having a fantastic day wherever you are in the universe, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Bye.